In Palo Alto, there's a little university. You might have heard of it, Stanford. <laughs> and there's a professor there named Kelly McGonigal who started a class that then became a book called The Science of Willpower. And in it, she says this, even in the Stone Age, we were practicing the rules of how to win people over, you know, how to, how to win friends and influence people, essentially. Even back then, you know, if somebody needed shelter, if our neighbor needed shelter, we offered it to them. Or, this, or if, you know, we had some dinner left and somebody was hungry, we shared it. You know, even then, you wouldn't look at somebody and say, you look fat in that loincloth. <laughs> we knew how to practice self-control, right? And that's really a big part of what the power of will is about. It's both that deep, beautiful surrender, giving over, melding into oneness. And then it's the putting the feet to the prayers, the part that is, is, is really just ours as a creature, a form, you know, that is just ours to embody the divine. It is our work to surrender to it, to recognize who we are. That's the willing part of the power of will. And then there is the willpower part of will that puts feet to it, that puts action to it. So this power that is the seventh of our 12 powers is really an embodiment of both, a full embodiment really of the divine and the human aspects of who we are, the wholeness of who we are. And so in this um, series, if you're just joining us, I like to every so often just remind people of where we are. All summer long, we've been studying the 12 powers, which is really a key teaching of unity. Co-founder Charles Fillmore really put forth the 12 powers. And the idea is that there are these different aspects of our divinity, different aspects of being that make up the whole. So as we look at each one, break down each one, look at each one and say, what is it to be in the full power of will, the full power of faith, to activate the power of the imagination or the divine power of love or wisdom or strength or or power or understanding? What does it look like for us to be in that, to open up to that power? And today's power is will, willingness to open, to receive, to be, to meld into, willingness then, or willpower to carry it through. So can you guess the number one reason why people say that they don't follow up on their goals? The not, what happens, what they're lacking is willpower, they say. <laughs> to see it through, to stay the course, to follow through on that intention, whatever that intention may have been. In Romans 7, it says, I do not understand what I do. For what I d want to do, I do not do. <laughs> and what I hate, I do. This I keep on doing. I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Wise words from Paul. Hmm? Because how many of us can relate? Can anybody relate to this? So I, I'm guessing by laughter that we can relate, right? So we find ourselves, you know, not understanding what I do. I have a desire to do this way, and then I do it this way. You know, it's like there's the, the Fitbit part of us and there's the cookie monster part of us, right? <laughs> Which one will win, you know? You know, it's like the story of the Native American grandfather who's telling his grandson, you know, there's a wolf inside my head that's barking, you know, take revenge. And there's a wolf inside my head that's saying peace and harmony. And the, the boy with, you know, eyes big as saucer says, Grandpa, which one's going to win? And Grandpa says, whichever one I feed. We can always choose which one will we feed, Fitbit or Cookie Monster, you know? <laughs> you know, we may have the intention to, to say, take more walks and take better care of ourselves. And then we get home and we grab the junk food and the remote control and pretty soon we lose our will to go for that walk, right? Because we've taken a different course. Or we have an intention that we're going to bolster our spiritual practice and so 
we, you know, set out to, oh, I'm going to start my day with prayer and meditation, but then we get caught up in whatever it is that we're doing that day, and we get busy doing that thing, whatever it is, our work or whatever it is, and, and by the end of the day, we feel depleted because we didn't really set that, that space, right? But here's the worst thing we can do when we find ourselves slipping from what we intended is then this is the, the willpower failure double whammy. So, so okay, so we didn't do what we said we were going to do, and now we're going to give ourselves a really hard time about it. Anybody ever do that? Oh, yeah, so it's guilt and shame and run over it again and again and again. So what good does that do, right? And so in fact, research plays out that if we in, go that route of beating ourselves up, we actually fail more because we need more comfort. <laughs> so we're going to reach for more of those outer comforts because we've now made ourselves feel very small. So instead, what could we do? Well, if we go within, there we will find the forgiveness. There we will find the ease. There we will find some, some graciousness and generosity for ourselves. And then we can kind of relax into, oh, OK, I can just reset my intention. It's not that serious, you know? It doesn't have to create this doom and gloom over us. So it really comes down to immediate gratification and long-term goals. You know, so if we set what it is that we want to do in a longer-term space and we stay the course with that, as my friend Albert used to say, keep your eye on the prize. In fact, he would close out our time together often with saying, I wish you, just so genuinely, I wish you happiness and I wish you prosperity. Keep your eye on the prize. And Albert, you know, against all odds, did a bunch of things. He was an African-American gay man. He, did, he got a PhD. He moved himself up in the state and all kinds of government positions. He came out to his family, which was a really big deal. And time and time again, he was the kind of guy who kept his eye on the prize. But what is the prize? The prize is a goal, yes, and it's a personal goal sometimes, but he also always had his eye on what served everyone, not just what served himself. And so that is a big part of our will as a spiritual power, is that it's part of the greater good. It's understood in the context of it's not just about me, but it's about all. And so we can put it in that context by asking the question of ourselves, what serves? At any given moment, what serves? And it will open us up into greater possibilities and ideas and thoughts and ways of being that get us closer to that experience that we just had of, of opening into and melding into the oneness that is the truth of who we are. So asking what serves and then recognizing that if there is a sense of, well, what serves me in the moment, what serves the greater good, feels like it's at odds, well, then we just sit with that a little bit and see, you know, what's, what, what's to be known, what's, what's to be seen and experienced through us. What is, what is the spirit of our being telling us? And that's where we follow. We get really confused on this thing called will, about God's will and our will, and are the two things different? Which one am I following? And what does God really want me to do? And if I surrender to that, what will, you know, what's going to happen with my life? And there's a lot of fear around that. So what is that? Why do we have this, this you know, difficulty with this idea? Well, the, the, it begs a question that comes before that, which is, what is God? <laughs> Because it's first defining what is this thing we call God that will then help us understand what is this idea of God's will versus our will. When we understand that God is not a superhuman being, it's not a personified idea of like a childhood God that's going to come in and punish or reward, but instead is the source of all life, the source of our very being, of ourselves, of our of everything that is an aspect of us. When we recognize the nature of God and the nature of us, then the question looks a little different. But it's when we're coming from that place of punishing or not enough, or I gotta look out for number one because there's not enough in the world, or I'm not enough, or I'm not worthy. Well then, yeah, there's gonna seem like there's a conflict between thy will be done and my will be done. 
But the truth is that when we go a little bit beneath and settle into the heart's desire, it is the same as the divine will. They're one and the same. When I was in my 20s, I, um, well, when I was in college, my friends and I would go out, we'd have a couple drinks, and we started to have cigarettes. So I kind of got used to this, was part of the social thing that we did. When I was in my 20s and working, I, um, I, I started to occasionally smoke, a sort of, I called it my thinking tool. So I'd like sit on the back porch and think about my day and take these long drags on a cigarette, you know, that I'd seen my mother do for years, you know. And, but I also had this um, like heaviness in my lungs that I didn't really like. And so I had this sort of love-hate relationship with it. You know, I would buy a pack, I'd smoke a few, and then I'd get disgusted, and I'd throw it out, and then I'd buy a pack. Anybody relate to this sort of cycle? Yeah? <laughs> and so, you know, then I got introduced to unity, and I got introduced to the practice of meditation. And I realized, aha, here it was, me trying to create this excuse to just be. Because out of this sense of worthiness means being busy and producing, I wasn't allowing myself just to be. Like I had to be doing something, even if it was just like smoking a silly cigarette, you know? It was just like I had to be doing something in order to relax. And so I realized, oh, there is this great purpose and power in just being, and just being still and being quiet. And there is an innate inherent goodness in us that I got introduced to in unity as well that shifted my thinking. And soon I realized I didn't need that nasty old habit to be. I could just give my permission, myself permission. So was it God's will that I would start to smoke? Of course not. Was it my will? No. What was the deeper will? What was the deeper will that was going on? One and the same, God's will and mine to be still. To be still and know that I am. So I just had the wrong strategy is all. <laughs> I had the wrong channel to the source. And then I found one that really worked for me. And it didn't cost me something, you know. So a lot of times we'll do things that cost us something because we don't have a better way. But that was a detrimental to my health way that it wasn't really working for me. I had all this conflict around it. And so for all of us, we can begin to recognize that by when we drop in, when we notice ourselves reaching, reaching, reaching outside of ourselves, we can just say, wait, wait a second. What if I just reach within? What if I'm just still, even for a minute? What if I just slow my breath, even for a minute, drop into my heart, see what it is? What is it that, what is the will? What is the will that is thine and mine that are one and the same? What is the desire here, the need here? It opens up all kinds of ahas and insights when we do this. Simple practice, a breath, a moment, stillness. So the power of will is not meant to be costly <laughs> because it's, guess what, free, right? Free will, it's the greatest gift we've been given. It's also a gift that takes courage to enact. Free will takes responsibility, which is maybe why our unity churches are not filled to overflowing every Sunday, but we'll keep bringing in more and more people who are willing to take responsibility for their own spiritual journey as that critical mass begins to shift in our world. More and more people will begin to flood into centers for spiritual living, unity churches, new thought places where they recognize, where people begin to recognize, it's not so bad. It's not so bad to have some charge of my life. It's not so bad to take responsibility, to no longer be a victim to the winds of change of life, but instead to be at the center of that life, working in partnership with spirit to move through life in a direction and make known in the world the very essence of God by our actions, by our will, by our willpower, and by our willingness. So where do we go from there? You know, it's like if we're making the choices in our free will, you know, so people say, why is there evil in the world if God is good goodness and God is loving? Well, because humans have free will. 
so we can make a lot of choices, right? We always have opportunities to choose and choose and choose. And so where do we choose? Do we align with the divine and make our choices? Or we do align with egoic ideas that are only self-serving and short-term? And then we get kind of boxed into that kind of thinking, you know? So the question is, you know, if, you want to keep, if we want to keep moving and making choices based in fear, based in beliefs of not enough, I'm not enough, there's not enough, you know, we can ask what the great sage always asks, how's that working for you? <laughs> Most of us will say, not really. Okay, so then let's try another way. We can ask ourselves that every so often, you know, how's this working for me? You know, maybe I could try another way. Maybe I could take a moment to pray and ground myself and then recalibrate, <laughs> reset, and then move in a new direction. I was swimming yesterday and um, it was one of those, you know, ah, I don't know, the talk's still not totally together. And so I'm swimming will, basically, you know, <laughs> the power of will, you know, just thinking about it and allowing and then going back to swimming and then just sort of coming back in and out of this. And I'm sharing my lap lane with one other swimmer. And as we're coming down, I see this man and his, presumably his child, but a small uh, child in his arms. And, and, you know, there's the shallow end for all the parents and children. And then there's the three lap lanes for people who are swimming laps. And so he begins to sort of move around the lane and come toward us. And I'm thinking as I'm swimming toward him, is this man completely oblivious? Like, isn't he noticing that this is a lap lane and that all the, you know, so these are the, you know, you know how that goes, starts going, right? The more I'm, faster I'm swimming, the more I'm spinning, right? And so then I get to the other side and I realize he's taken my kickboard and now his little one is floating around on the kickboard, you know? So I'm like, oh man, you know, I got it when I was coming in. I don't want to have to get out and walk all the way across, you know. It's bougie suffering is what Brenly and I call this, <laughs> call each other on that. Um, or do I want to ask him and can I really take the kickboard from this cute little being that's having so much joy? And so, so I'm still thinking about it as I come to the other, you know, another lap, right? <laughs> another lap, think about it some more, see what we can come up with here. And so then I began to go, okay, wait a second, you know, the power of will, <laughs> willingness. What if I were willing? What if I were willing? What would happen if I were willing? And then suddenly it opens up from not just like my need and my ideas and, you know, la, 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 to, wow, I love watching men play with children so engaged like that, so tender and so encouraging. You know, so, and I'm assuming it's a father and daughter, but it doesn't really matter. It's just like how sweet that he is like really, you know, enjoying showing her how fun it is to swim and how easy it is that she can do this with this. I mean, she was little, little tiny girl, like just about as long as the kickboard. And, you know, so, so why, what am I doing getting all tied up about this? How ridiculous, you know? And as soon as I opened up to the greater good, to that idea of appreciation and engagement and recognizing what was really before me and came to the other side, they had already abandoned the kickboard and it was, you know, it was like not far away. But regardless, it wasn't my kickboard to begin with, right? So we get a little bit like, hmm, it's mine. And it's like, who said that was yours, you know? So it's also that kind of, that idea of when we talked about the power of imagination, Imagine there are no possessions, you know? When we get a little me and mine-ish, we can begin to recognize, oh, what if we just opened up to, to, we're all in this together. And if we're all in this together, what is the greatest thing happening right now? It's actually this man and this child playing and exploring swimming together. You know, that was actually the greatest thing that was happening in our lane. And so that maybe we can ask ourselves that. What's the greatest thing that's happening in my lane right now, in this lane, <laughs> you know? In this trajectory, in this space, in this sanctuary. It's, you know, what is the greatest thing that's happening in this sanctuary right now? It's not the words I'm speaking, it's the energy, right? It's the, it's the intentionality behind it. It's, it's the, the energy of coming together, it's the connection, it's the inspiration, it's the ahas, it's the realization, it's the sense of being part of a community, 
a place where we're all in this together and we know it and we're working together and we're walking together and we're evolving together and we're using the power of will together and we're activating our ability and our willingness to surrender to the one and then act accordingly. I mean, wouldn't it be great if every person on earth was interested in doing this once a week? <laughs> you know, I want to get infused with a little spirituality through music and through a message. I want to, be, I want to meditate and get still my mind, and I want to be in positive community together. If every person had that great privilege and gift, what a world we would create. What a world we are creating by being that for others right here. That is a willingness and a willpower, a power of will that allows us to stay the course and stay the course and stay the course. We have a mission here to teach universal spiritual principles. And we stay that course and we stay that course. We have core values that we embody, love and connection and so on. And so we stay that course. It gives us the guidelines, but it doesn't mean we get you know, myopic about it. We then open up. What does spirit, spirit have to say about what that is? How does that look when we infuse it with an understanding from spirit? Same with our lives. Same with our own goals. Same with our own intentions. Same with our intentions in our families and other organizations that we're a part of. We bring those intent, that power of will, that power of understanding or imagination or faith, all of the powers with us. So... Uh, Joseph Goldstein was um, practicing this power of willingness. He didn't know. <laughs> he was also practicing the power of willpower, which he was really aware of. Joseph Goldstein is a um, teacher of insight meditation, Western Vipassana, um, the, West, the Western version of Vipassana. Um, it's a Buddhist kind of meditation practice. And um, he was in in study at the time when he was working with a Zen master in his early years, Suzaki Roshi was his master. And um, Suzaki Roshi would have him come in, it was very strict, so he would meditate all day, and then he would come in four times a day to have an interview, essentially. But there would be a koan he was given, which is kind of like a riddle, and he would be meant to you know, go off and meditate on the koan and then come back and give an answer. And so he comes in the first time, and the Roshi says, no, very stupid answer. He's like, oh, wow, OK. So then he goes back and meditates for another five or 10 hours you know, on the next koan. And he comes back, and the, and the master teacher says, um, OK, but not very zen. All right, so then he gives him a chant. It's a, the, the koan is about a chant. And Joseph just knows. It's not, he's not supposed to come back with some intellectual response to the thing about a chant, but he's actually supposed to chant. Now this puts him in a complete tizzy because public singing is like the scariest thing you could possibly think for him to do. You know? So he goes into this space of absolute vulnerability, of worry, and so he uses his full willpower, right? I'm going to nail this thing. I'm going to get this right. I'm going to, you know, it's like that armor we put on when we're like getting in a place of force. So, so willpower can be like the, the staying the course, and it can also be like a driver. It can be like, you know, willfulness. We can get willful about it. And so he practices, and he practices, and he practices, so he can be so, and it's very simple chant. And he gets in the room, and he goes to open his mouth and chant, and it's just a complete train wreck. I mean, the words are jumbled, and it, there's no melody, there's no rhythm to it, and he's just, you know, he's sweating, he's tense, he's nervous, he doesn't even want to make eye contact. And his teacher looks at him, and it's the first time he has felt this just pouring of warmth and compassion. And his teacher says, very good. And so it is so very good when we are willing. When we are willing, when we are open, when we follow Spirit's guidance, we may have to cross those vulnerable spaces, those raw spaces, those places of being completely exposed into the unknown. It may take courage. And yet, it's so very good. <laughs> so very good because that's where the healing happens. 
That's where the transformation happens. That's where we get it. That's where we recognize, ah, my will and thine is one. Because the divine is me. That's when we have those kinds of understandings of moving into the deeper spaces. It's not about getting it right. It's about opening ourselves to be willing and then following it through with the steps from there, the action from there that God can't take, spirit can't take. It doesn't have the hands and the feet and the form that we have. And so we have that great gift. It's where we pick up our human gift, a form, and say, I will make it so in the world, through me, as me. That's the will at work in the way that is intended to work. When the will is ready, Proverbs said, the feet are light. And so it isn't any longer this sort of armored, difficult, forceful kind of thing. But the will is ready, and so the feet are light. And the flow is there for us, and the doing is a joy for us. And the swimming is easy. <laughs> And the walking is easy. And the recognizing everyone is in this together is a joy and a connection and a space of love. That's all of that can be done through the power of will, a willingness, and a willpower to see it through. So together we are, in truth, just dropping in, asking what serves, and then taking the action accordingly aligning with the divine, and then intentionally acting. Let's affirm that knowing together as we work this power of will this week. Together, I align with the divine and take intentional action. And so it is.